Roger, Roger, 595. Roger, Roger, 73. All right. Well, since I wasn't up last week, I'm sure you wouldn't have any questions on the previous chapter seven, but we'll, we'll ask if anybody has any questions anyway. No questions? Very good. So uh, I'd like to welcome the online viewers. I know we seem to be getting more and more of those every, every week. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So if we've got people watching this online, uh, please send Gary or myself an email got an email here because we may be able to help you out along the way. And uh, we'll be doing this chapter in two parts. There's uh, part one and part two. Isn't that amazing? In credits, uh, ARRL, a lot of this material is, uh, at least some of the graphics are from them. And Dave Kastler was good enough to grant us permission to use some of his graphics. And we've had a lot of inputs from past students and from some of you that have uh, helped improve these presentations. So thank you. So here we are tonight. These are the three areas that we'll be talking about. Emission designators and terms, that's gonna go really fast because there are no pool questions. So we'll just maybe look at one slide and, and let that one go, uh, just so you've got some of the historical background. Frequency and phase modulation, there's some confusing things in here. Uh, was anybody, anybody confused as you were reading that in the book? All right, yeah. Um, well, I've spent a lot of time making that a little bit easier, so we'll, we'll see if it works tonight. And then multiplexing in 8.1, then we'll be getting into 8.2. So here's, uh, speaking of emission designations, these started out uh, fairly simple uh, in the beginning, but they've become more and more complicated. On page 8.8-2 in your book, and look at that for just a minute. You can see that there's all kinds of things listed here. And if you are a real glutton for punishment, you can read uh, the FCC rules. It gets into this in, in a great deal of detail. So I wanted you to be aware that they were there. They're standardized uh, through the ITU. And the common ones used in amateur radio, I just picked out a few to put them down here. We usually refer to uh, modes or designations uh, just as modes. So we've got single sideband or AM or FM, digital, that's how we refer to them in amateur radio, RTTY and so forth. There are these multi-letter designators that correspond to those. And that's about all that we'll really talk about here. Uh, Dave Kastler had some real good background and history on modes. Uh, if you haven't seen his video, I recommend it. So we'll jump right into modulation systems. Um, and I did spend quite a bit of time getting this class ready to clarify some of the things that were fuzzy. And I found out I didn't understand it as well as I thought I did. <laughs> so with that, I, I hope this will, will be, a, be a help to you. So um, We've got amplitude modulation, and then frequency and phase modulation are in a class that are called angle modulation. It's kind of interesting because as you change the frequency, the phase changes. If you change the phrase, the, the phase, the frequency changes. So they're mathematically uh, related. And if done properly, there's no way to tell on the receive side which one is being used. And you don't have a lot of choice in the matter because whatever your transceiver supports is, is what you'll be using. Now the first mode, voice mode that we had in ham radio was amplitude modulation. And then some of these other fun things came around a little bit later. And here's a graphic. And I'll, I'll keep trying to tie past principles to current ones. Here we've got a signal. Actually, did I expand this? No, I didn't. OK. Um, we've got a signal. This is a voice signal. And with amplitude modulation, we're varying the amplitude of the combined carrier and voice. With FM, we're changing the frequency. You can see some of these peaks are much closer together than, than others. So 
and we're changing the frequency above and below the carrier. And to connect a past concept, remember peak envelope power? The only way to tell what your power is here for measuring at FCC wise is to go to these, to these peaks. And with AM, you can see where the peaks are. With FM, it's a continuous carrier, basically. So the peak envelope power is actually the power output of your transceiver. So we'll talk a little bit more here about frequency and phase modulation. We'll be using an example at uh, 29.6 megahertz. Something kind of magic happens at 29 megahertz that I wasn't real clear on in, until I reviewed all this material again. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that. So the RF frequency varies at the rate of the modulating signal frequency. So if we start out at 29.6 megahertz, that's uh, uh, we'd have, let's say, an AM carrier, the carrier is sitting there at that frequency. When we apply a modulating signal to it, it's going to vary above and below that 29.6. And the most common um, deviation rate for FM and amateur radio is plus or minus five kilohertz, which means that the signal will go above um, 29 meg and below it. So it'll go from about um, 29,595, five kilohertz below, to 29,605. And the difference between those is 10 kilohertz. So the bandwidth is 10 kilohertz. We're going plus or minus five. So we're deviating from the carrier by five kilohertz, but we're going above and below. So that's the idea of the plus or minus five. And in order to prevent the signal from getting too wide and splattering all over the band, an FM transmitter will just about always have a very effective limiter in it so that you can't over-modulate. Usually you can't even adjust the, um, the mic gain so that you, there's no possibility of over-deviating. So we're going to be coming up on a couple of concepts here. Um, deviation is, uh, I've mentioned it, but didn't explain it too well. Deviation is how far you're moving from the carrier frequency without applying any audio to it. And the amount of frequency change is proportional to the modulating signal amplitude. So if you talk real soft like this, you might be modulating plus or minus one. If you're talking really loud like this, then you might be going the full plus or minus five. So it, it varies with, with uh, speech level or amplitude. And there's a couple of concepts that we're going to be getting into that are very similar. That's why they're so confusing. One is deviation ratio and one is modulation index. We'll be talking about those. And the thing, the important thing, especially when we see the formula, um, which you don't need to know, by the way, is that for deviation ratio and really for modulation index as well, uh, those values are a constant for a given band or frequency. So as, as the uh, RF frequency changes or you change bands, these, the index or the ratio will, will not change by, by band. There's a pool question that asks something about that. This diagram was helpful to me. This is from Kassler. And what we're showing here is an FM carrier frequency. And we're going to be deviating. It's going to be an FM signal. And we're going to be deviating plus or minus 3 kilohertz when we apply a modulating waveform of 2 volts. So we're going to have speech signal, or in this case, it's a single tone, um, being applied at 2 volts, which will modulate our, our uh, FM transmitter to plus or minus three kilohertz. If we had half that amount of applied signal, modulating waveform equals one volt. Now we're going to, going to, only going to be modulating at plus or minus 1.5. So you can see the louder the audio applied to the FM modulator, the greater the deviation. We doubled the signal. We started out with one volt at 1.5 kilohertz plus or minus. We doubled it, and that doubled the modulation. If we kept doing that, of course, that wouldn't go on forever because we'd, we'd hit a, a limitation so that uh, the transmitter would prevent us from over-modulating. So if, we, if I double the speech level or the volume, I'll double the deviation.
until I get up to the limiting level. And here's uh, the, we'll talk about deviation ratio a little bit. And um, the definition, and I'll give you a hint here to help remember when you see this uh, in the pool question, deviation ratio is the ratio of the maximum carrier frequency deviation to the highest audio modulating frequency. The way that that's written as a formula, the deviation ratio, which is what we're talking about, be maximum deviation, so that would typically be plus or minus five kilohertz, and then the modulating frequency maximum. And what's our typical maximum audio uh, frequency that we use? 3,000 3, cycles, three, or three kilohertz, exactly. So deviation ratio typically would be five divided by three, which is like uh, 1.6 or something like that. And uh, the, as a ratio, this, this is a fixed value. You can't really change it. It's built into the radio by the manufacturer. And then there are, I think, three calculations uh, in this section. And um, the way that we could apply that here, it says calculate the deviation ratio. This is an actual pool question. Calculate the deviation ratio of an FM phone signal having a maximum frequency swing of plus or minus 7.5 kilohertz. That would be kind of unusual because typically it would be plus or minus five. But on UHF frequencies, that this could happen. Um, when the maximum modulating frequency is 3.5 kilohertz, that's also more than you'd normally be applying audio-wise. But the way that, that, it, that it's solved, it's 7.5 deviation maximum divided by 3.5 kilohertz, giving us an answer of 2.14. Now there's a hint that makes, uh, uh, eliminates the need to memorize the formulas. So for an exam hint, for both deviation ratio and modulation index, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, the way that you can do the calculation uh, is divide the bigger number by the smaller. Remember we did, uh, there was something else we ran into where we used that same technique, was the gain of an op amp, where <laughs> whatever the values were, take the bigger one, divide it by the smaller one, and, and that, that's gonna be, the same pattern applies here. So if you can remember that, you don't necessarily have to remember the formula, but you know how to do it now. And also, for all of the questions, I think there's three of them that, that ask these math questions. In all cases, no unit conversions are needed. Either the deviation will be, well, the deviation will be in kilohertz, the modulating frequency will be in kilohertz or hertz both ways. So there's nothing tricky about unit conversions. So that makes the math extremely simple. And we'll see more of those as we get to them. So this is deviation ratio. And the, the thing that you need to associate with deviation ratio is this is, let's see, I bolded this, the ratio of the maximum carrier frequency deviation to the highest audio modulating frequency. That's the definition of deviation ratio. There'd be a different definition for modulation index, but try to associate this maximum and highest, those words, with deviation ratio, and that'll help you. Modulation index, this sounds somewhat similar. Modulation index is the ratio between the frequency deviation, just like it was with the ratio. Modulation index is the ratio between the frequency deviation of an RF carrier and the modulating frequency of an FM signal. This doesn't say the maximum. That's a key difference. So and the way of saying it, <clears throat> ratio of, of maximum RF frequency deviation to the instantaneous modulating frequency. So as we're speaking, our, our voice frequencies are all over the place between 300 and, and 3,000. The modulation index refers to whatever the, the frequency is at that exact instant in time. This is just concept right now, or, or theory. Now sometimes it helps to think of an index. We've had other indexes. An index will typically be between zero and one, um, and it, it's a range of values that we could possibly have. And we can see that we could have a range of values because the frequencies that are being applied are varying between 300 and 3,000 with, with speech. So if, if that helps you um, 
categorize an index with, with a range of values going on that, that may be helpful. Now here's something really interesting. FCC limits modulation index to a maximum of 1.0 under 29 megahertz. And I'll, I'll have a little bit more on that. Now, where is 29 megahertz? What, what band is that? So the 10 meter band. And the, uh, the, the place where I was getting tripped up a little bit, I always thought of the 10 meter band, band as 28 megahertz. Well, that's where it starts, but it goes up to like 29.7 or something like that. So uh, this 29 megahertz number uh, falls in the high end of, of the uh, 10 meter band. So some, something changes in the rules when you get over that point. Now, notice uh, if, if this is true here, and it is, it's in the FCC rules, then some of these things that we calculated prior, like this number, that would actually be illegal <laughs> if it were below 29 megahertz. And I think just about all of the examples that they give us in the pool questions um, are numbers that are greater than, than 1.0. And we'll have a little bit more on that to come. And here's another example. This is, again, a pool question. Max frequency deviation of plus or minus 3,000 hertz, 3 kC, kilohertz, and modulation frequency of 1,000 hertz gives us a modulation index of 3. Okay, which again would be illegal if we were trying to do that at less than 29 megahertz. But above 29 megahertz, you can do it. And again, modulation index is not dependent on the RF carrier frequency. If you remember the formula, it was deviation divided by uh, an audio frequency. The RF frequency wasn't a part of the formula. So it's important to remember that the modulation index is not dependent on RF carrier frequency or the band that you happen to be on. And this, um, I added this slide from the last time we did this. And again, FCC limits modulation index to a maximum of one under 29 megahertz. And you might remember the considerate operator's frequency guide. It was, uh, we shared it in either the technician or the general class. And it said where you find certain kinds of frequencies within the ham bands. And I, I pulled out um, a section here that I'll show you. So 10 meters runs from 28 megahertz to 29.7 megahertz. Now notice on the high end of 10 meters, starting at 29 megahertz, that's um, the band plan that's for AM people. Now starting at 29,300 and going up, Satellite downlinks, don't care about that in the context of what we're talking about here. But here we've got repeater inputs, FM simplex, and repeater outputs. These specifically are, are FM repeaters, and they're all above 29. Therefore, um, we can use plus or minus 5 kilohertz deviation uh, at normal voice frequencies and be completely legal. So the, the thing that I was hung up on was if, if uh, the limit is one, how come we've got all of these, or why, why couldn't you be legal with plus or minus five kilohertz and normal voice frequencies? Well, this is the answer, because where the repeaters in simplex frequencies are for FM are all above 29 megahertz. So at this point, you'll probably never forget for the rest of your life that uh, the modulation index maximum is 1.0 <laughs> for 29 and below. Does that make sense? Sort of, kind of? Okay. I'm so happy. This will connect to another concept. Um, we talked a little bit about creating a frequency modulation and phase modulation in some past sessions. And we talked about um, the, with, with direct FM, which means we're changing the frequency of the oscillator, the audio that's being applied, frequency of the modulating signal, really doesn't matter. There's, there's no natural pre-emphasis or emphasis of higher frequencies. With phase modulation, though, there is. 
So the deviation for phase modulation, well, let me back up. The deviation for uh, direct FM is basically the amplitude of the modulating signal, how, how loud we're talking. So an FM deviation, uh, FM that's direct FM, deviation depends only on the modulating signal amplitude, how loud we're talking. With phase modulation, the deviation depends on both the modulating signal amplitude and the frequency, which is why we get this effect. Now, do you remember what we had to do with direct FM to make it look like this? The problem is if, if, we, were, if, if we just left it this way, a phase modulated signal and a direct FM would sound very different at the receive end. So what we had to do is we had to pre-emphasize the frequencies for direct FM to make the output of the transmitter look like this. Then we could use de-emphasis on the receive side to flatten it back out again. So a direct FM signal or a phase, modulation, phase modulated signal would, would look exactly the same on, and sound the same on the receive side. So this, this connects to deviation um, in a way that's different than we talked about before. Any questions there? There aren't any questions on the test, but I, I thought it was really interesting how this all linked together. And now we'll get into multiplexing. Uh, there's some very interesting and fun things that, that happened there. Multiplexing is combining more than one stream of information into one modulated signal. Now what we're used to on single sideband, we've got our voice frequencies, we're talking in a microphone, and that's what's going out on the air. We've got one voice channel modulating one transmitter. It's possible to actually um, combine multiple voice channels and transmit them as well and have them stay separate from each other. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. Because if I gave two of you microphones and you were both talking at the same time, it would be kind of a mess on the other end. But the concepts of multiplexing let you maintain at least the appearance of having completely separate audio channels and, and having those uh, be private. Very popular with the phone companies, by the way. They, they typically, uh, they might run 48 channels of multiplexed audio over one signal path. And there's some uh, advanced digital modes in amateur radio that, that do something similar. And we're also going to be linking this to another concept. Remember we were talking about sampling, where we were taking little snapshots of uh, frequencies of, of a signal waveform to convert it to a digital form. We've got another concept of sampling that occurs in multiplexing that we're going to see. It works differently, but uh, it'll, it'll connect back. So first of all, we'll look at frequency division, multiply, uh, frequency di division multiplexing where we're dealing with multiple subcarriers. That's the first style. There'll be two styles that we'll look at. And that's usually analog. And then we're going to look at time division multiplexing. Here's where we're going to be interleaving two or more signals into, into discrete time slots. So I'm going to uh, sample Kirby for a few milliseconds and I'm going to sample David for a few milliseconds and then your audio is going to go into different time slots but it'll be happening so fast that it'll sound like you have independent channels. So here's an example of uh, how frequency division multiplex works and I'll expand some of this so you can see it better. Frequency division multiplex is when we have two or more information streams or, or voice, voice signals, let's say, combined into a baseband group, which then modulates the transmitter. Now, baseband, it's helpful to think of the term baseband as what we're applying to the modulator. What we apply to the modulator will then get transmitted on the air, go out to the receiving side, and the receiver will have to demodulate that. So if we're sending four or five simultaneous voice channels um, out on our transmitter, we'll have to demodulate it, that on the receive side. And the places that this is used, uh, amateur multi-carrier digital modes, which I don't know very much about, um, phone company carrier circuits, you might have heard of T1 circuits, T4 circuits, 
cable TV, FM broadcast, uh, subcarrier. You know how they send uh, Muzak out to the stores? A lot of that's done with a subcarrier. Let's look now at how this is actually accomplished. Frequency division multiplex, usually analog, using subcarriers. So let's look at these slots here, not time slots, but channels. This is channel one, two, three, and four. Channel one has audio frequencies ranging from 0.1 to 3.5 kilohertz. That's 100 cycles up to 3,500. So that's just like we're used to seeing on a sideband transmitter. But we're going to have a second channel. We're going to have a 4 kilohertz subcarrier. And we're going to apply the same range of audios, but it's be somebody, else, somebody else's conversation. And what we're going to do with that voice channel is multiplex it up to 4.1 to 7.5 kilohertz. So now we've got two voice channels that are being modulated at the same time. But because they're on different frequencies, after they've been mixed and moved up the band, that neither one will be able to hear the other. And we can continue on and on and on. Here's channel three. It's got an eight kilohertz subcarrier frequency. And now our audio frequencies are 8.1 to 11.5 kilohertz. And then channel four, it's a 12 kilohertz subcarrier. We do the same thing. So now we've got all of these signals happening at one time. Sounds like kind of a mess, doesn't it? But they're all kept separate because they're on different frequencies. So we've got four different audio channels uh, with four different conversations going on, if you want to call it that, at one time. So let's see what happens now um, from the transmitter and receiver point of view. So here's our one through four voice channels, voice signals being combined with these four subcarriers. That this this uh, is just uh, base audio. Or what I mean by that is the 100 to 3.5 kilohertz. And here's these that have been moved up. So this is called baseband information here. It's all summed together. And this baseband signal is then, uh, it, it modulates the transmitter. So all of that stuff is coming out the antenna at the same time. On the receiver, we're going to do the same, we're going to do the reverse process and demodulate these. We'll be using the equivalent of, of mixers, mixing each of those audio channels back to their, to their audio frequencies, and then you can hear them. Four different channels. So just to summarize, frequency division multiplex, we've got two or more information streams combined into a baseband group which then modulates the transmitter. Then we saw the common, common usage cases here. So there's a lot of that going on, cable TV and uh, phone company in the old days. Kirby. Doesn't this produce a much wider? Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. So these kinds of things you wouldn't have, you wouldn't see it on HF for sure. You wouldn't see them on HF, yep because we, we've got much wider stuff going on here. Voice of America used these systems on some of their older microwave, microwave radio yep, systems. Yep, yep, and those were called the MUX units, uh, microwave MUX. We would take all of those channels. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. That's frequency division multiplex. We're using subcarriers and usually analog electronics to do that. The other one is digital time division multiplex. And here we see something a little bit different happening. We'll read the definition first. In this case, with time division multiplex, or TDM, we've got two or more signals arranged to share discrete time slots of a data transmission. So here we see a rotating switch. Now, I don't know what monkey is turning that knob, but he's going to get awful tired after a while. But this, this is all done uh, electronically. So here we've got conversation A going on. We're going to sample A for a short period of time and put it into a time slot. So here's a picture over here of a signal with, with time slots. So A is going to go here. And then the switch is going to move over to conversation B. Actually, let me, I got a bigger picture of it here, yeah. So when we go to conversation B, 
we're going to sample that for a short period of time and pass it on uh, down the road. And this is happening up to, well, in this case, it's, it's only showing five of them. Now, the thing that's really amazing about this is it's happening so fast. We're sampling enough of the audio conversation, and it's happening so quickly that the perception on the receive side is that that conversation is going on uh, unimpeded. Um, so Gary can be talking to Tom at the same time that uh, I'm talking to Ray, for example. Each conversation appears to be uninterrupted and completely private, because we're taking each one and moving them into the respective time slots, keeping them separated. Now, it could get really interesting if, if this got out of sync, right? But since this is being done, <laughs> since this is being done digitally, that pretty much never happens. So here we're back to the, to the full picture again. We're showing these sampled channels being put into time slots and then uh, decoded from there. So it's two or more signals arranged to share discrete time slots of a data transmission. This is generally digital. Each conversation is sampled and inserted into a time slot in a digital stream, which is also called interleaving. The switching speed is fast enough to create the impression that you've got a private channel between the people. In an amateur usage, uh, this is applied in D-Star, some of you have heard about. Some other digital modes, satellite repeater telemetry, and in commercial usage, digital phone circuits, ISDN service, which you've heard of, and um, the earlier days of cellular. Kessler makes the the comment that rather than using uh, TDM anymore, it's code division multiplex, which gets way too complex for, for us to worry about. But uh, this, this is practical, it's real, it's uh, being used all the time. All right, well, we covered a lot of really interesting things there. Let's see if, see if we can nail the questions now. See if I give you enough hints. What is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulating frequency for angle modulation be below 29 megahertz. Yep, that was the one. A lot of words there, but the 29 megahertz is magic, and below that, you can't go over a modulation index of 1.0. But you don't have to worry about that because that's built into your transceiver. The manufacturer would have made it that way. You just need to, you're, you're getting some of the theory behind that. What is the term for the ratio between the frequency deviation of an RF carrier wave and the modulating frequency of its corresponding FM phone signal? Now, we talked about modulation index and deviation ratio. Do we see one of those in the answer? Yep. And they made that easy because you don't have to distinguish between the two. There, there's a harder one coming up. But you're going to get that, because I gave you all the clues. By the way, this won't be bolded in, in your <laughs> test, OK? How do, but I'm wanting you to remember this. How does the modulation index of a phase modulated emission vary with RF carrier frequency? What was that? D, D yep. It does not depend on the RF carrier frequency. The, the formula was, the formula was uh, uh, deviation and maximum audio frequency, and the RF carrier frequency wasn't a part of that calculation. So it does not depend on the RF carrier frequency. Good. So now we won't need to bold this, and you'll still get it right. What? OK, here's a really tough one. If anybody gets this one wrong, you're going to have to start the course over from the beginning. So let's see what we can do. What is? <laughs> what is the modulation index of an FM phone signal having a maximum frequency deviation of 3,000 hertz, either side of the carrier frequency, when the modulating frequency is 1,000 hertz? Oh, okay, good. You don't have to take this course over again. All right, yeah. So, like I said, the math is extremely simple on these. There's about three of these. Okay, now here they're asking, what was that first one? Okay, it was modulation, in, this is modulation index as well, but it doesn't matter for the calculation. What is the modulation index of an FM phone signal having a max carrier deviation of plus or minus six kilohertz when modulated with a two kilohertz modulating frequency? Yep, 
they, they put it in slightly different terms and, and units, but it's still the big one divided by the small one. Oh, this one's got a decimal point in it. This, this might throw you off. What is the uh, deviation? Now, this says deviation ratio. The other two we did were modulation index, but the formula works exactly the same way. What is the deviation ratio of an FM phone signal having a maximum frequency swing of plus or minus 5 kilohertz when the maximum modulation frequency is 3 kilohertz? Um, I heard C from somebody? D, D, D. All right, so 5 divided by 3 um, is a little bit more, or a little bit less than 2. So you could estimate that, or you could whip out your calculator and do 5 divided by 3 to, to get to 1.67. So all three of those, if you see any of them, you'll know how to do. What is, okay, here's another one. I thought we only had three. It looks like we got four. What is the deviation ratio of an FM phone signal having maximum frequency swing of plus or minus 7.5? We did this in one of our slides. When the maximum modulation frequency is 3.5 kilohertz. I heard A, and it, it is A. It's a little bit more than two. You could calculate it or estimate it. It's easy to estimate. What is meant by deviation ratio? You know, this one you'll have to go back and stretch your memory banks just a little bit. And there were two particular words that were worth picking out. Did I hear B? B, okay. And, and the, uh, the words here are maximum carrier frequency to the highest audio modulating frequency. And you need to associate that maximum and highest with deviation ratio. Or you can remember the, the formula, but this is a lot easier. It's also the only answer with the word deviation in it, isn't it? Um, Both question and answer deviation. Is that right? Oh, you are absolutely right. Okay, so that there's another mental trick that you can use. Now it says, what is meant by deviation ratio? <laughs> the only question or answer with deviation in it happens to be the right one. Okay, thank you for that trick from all of us, including me. What describes frequency division multiplexing? Okay, now we have to think about what we learned about frequency division multiplexing. It's usually analog and it usually uses subcarriers. Let's see if that... B, two or more information streams merged into a baseband, which then modulate the transmitter. Information streams, okay, they don't call it um, subcarriers here, but the, that, that's what this is. Good, very good. What is digital time division multiplexing? You now here we see the word subcarriers, but don't let that trip you. B it is, two or more signals are arranged to share discrete time slots of a data transmission. So digital time division multiplexing, that was that sampling concept where we were switching rapidly between different different uh, voice channels or signal. Also works, it's the only one that says time in it. Yes, yeah, only one has time slots. No, so has time it slots, yes, time slots is a key no, no, no. Time slots is definitely associated with, with digital time division multiplexing. So there, there's a, a couple of ways you can, you can get to that one. Okay, digital protocols and modes. Let's see how we're doing for timing. We are doing just totally awesome for timing. You might even get out early tonight. You've been very well behaved tonight. Very special class. Now the Kessler, <laughs> I'll make a comment. The Kessler video, although it was excellent, all of his stuff is excellent. It got pretty complicated in places. Uh, I don't know if you picked up on he said, well, now the engineer in me wants to tell you, <laughs> said, whoa, <laughs> my head's gonna explode. Um, but fortunately, um, that, that won't be an impediment to your passing the test. But it is quite interesting. I, I enjoyed it very much. Of course, I'm kind of weird. All right, digital activity, finding digital activity. 
uh, well, where, where can we look? There are certain places on the bands, and, and here's, uh, here, here's some of them. Um, does anybody know what kind of radio this is besides David? <laughs> and Tom, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a hint. Yeah, that's a hint, yeah, because it's a uh, ICOM IC 7300. And the reason that I picked that is, is uh, something to, to illustrate, something you can use for digital activity. It's got a built-in sound card. It's an SDR. Remember, we've been talking about SDR radios. Um, it's about, I think it's a little under $1,000 now, and it's probably the best value for, for the buck out there for somebody just getting into ham radio, if you can afford that, that price level. Uh, you can go way, way, way above that in price level, but th this is just, a, in my opinion, is a, a, an excellent starter radio. And not necessarily a starter radio. Some people use these for contesting and all kinds of other things. So. I'm still trying to graduate into it. <laughs> yeah, he's, he wants one. David's got one. I'd like one for a backup radio. It's, it's just, um, I, I, and I've helped, uh, I should get a commission from ICOM because I think I've sold three or four of these just by recommending it and have helped people set them up. And uh, I, I, I have one that's a, the bigger brother to this one, the uh, 7610. But this does 80% uh, of what, what that higher end one does. So there's specific um, watering holes, I'll call them, for different kinds of data emission. And the, these aren't um, specific here to different kinds of emissions, but there are specific places on each band where you can find digital activity. Getting started with digital, there's a couple of books available from the ARRL. Get on the Air with HF Digital is one, and this is in its second edition now, uh, which means it now includes uh, FT8, which is the, uh, probably the newest mode that's out there that has just taken amateur radio by storm. And then this book is a little bit older, but it, it does uh, provide some, some background. Sometimes they run a special where you can get both of these for, for one price. But um, they're good ways to get started or find an Elmer. Uh, I've worked with uh, probably um, six, eight hams, helping them get set up with some of this kind of stuff. And I would do the same thing for any of you. So now let's get into it a little bit. There's some theory behind digital protocols and modes that um, uh, I, I think you'll use throughout your entire amateur radio career. So I've uh, presented this from a couple of different points of view. So we'll talk about symbol rate, data rate, bandwidth, protocols, and codes. And you read about some of this in the book. So the first thing is definitions, um, a bit. Does anybody know what bit stands for? Binary digit. We usually think of them in terms of ones or zeros, but a bit is a binary digit. There's our dictionary, but it's closed, so you'll have to trust me. Bit rate, number of digital bits per second sent from one computing system to the other, or bits per second. How fast can the computers exchange data between them? That's the bit rate. Now a symbol, a symbol is a characteristic of the transmitted signal that represents data. And symbols and bits per second aren't necessarily the same thing. We'll talk more about that. But the symbol rate is going to be really important. The symbol rate is the rate at which the waveform of a transmitted signal changes to convey information. So just remember that as a definition for the moment. And the term baud or bauds, it's the number of symbols sent per second. So the baud is the same as symbol rate. Symbol rate and baud are the same. Now I've got a diagram here. This is from Kessler as well. This is Bob and this is Alice. Now Bob and Alice want to carry on some kind of communications, digital or analog. And they're, let's say they're talking. So there's information going to a computer. Maybe a voice over IP would, would be a, uh, uh, a good thing to use for an example here. So they don't know what's going on up here, all, all of this crazy stuff. But they're talking into some kind of a microphone or a telephone handset that's going to a computing device. And the data link is what one computer um, sees from the other one. So in this case, the arrows are going this way. So when 
uh, when Bob talks, information, all he knows is voice. He knows English. All Ellis knows is English. But his voice is converted to digital and winds up at this other computer digitally, and then it gets converted back to analog so Alice can hear it. So this, this is called a data link. There's something else that happens. Now, Bob and Alice have no idea what's happening out here, unless they're hams studying for the extra test, and, and then they know all of this, just like you do, or will. So the computers don't know. Um, all they know is that they're getting something from another computer. But we're actually going to send this over the air. So we've got a data link going on here, and we've got an air link going on. And the air link is what's happening between the modulator of a transmitter. It's being transmitted and comes out the demodulator and then comes down to the computing device. I think I've got that illustrated here. Yeah, here's the air link up here. So all, all, the, all the radios know is that they're transmitting and receiving. All the computers know is that they're getting bits, they're sending bits out and getting bits in. They don't know about the air link. They don't know about Bob and Alice. Bob and Alice, they don't know that any of this is happening unless they're hams. And here's the data link illustrated. There's one more diagram here. Yeah, this, this is the complete communications channel where we see Bob and Alice actually have names. And uh, what's been added here is a virtual data link, computer to computer, virtual information link. This is person to person. And then we've got the air link between the transmitter and the receiver. So that, that's the complete, complete system. Now, we haven't talked so far about um, data rates and how data rates get converted to symbol rates and uh, how all of that relates. But we'll, we'll get into that next. Now, I don't know where I originally uh, heard this analogy, but to me it was just extremely helpful. So I, I hope it'll be helpful to you as well in talking about baud versus bit rate. So consider this. If you hold up one hand, we've got one signaling event. So I could raise my hand and I'm saying hi to Gary or to Ray or to Tom. Say hi. Good. Now, in this example, one signaling event can represent six states. They're really five positive bits, because I've got five fingers, right? Or I could hold up my hand, and you'd, I'd have uh, no fingers. That's the six. Well, two to the fifth winds up being 32 bits. Remember, we talked about how to calculate number of bits from uh, uh, how many you have, two to the fifth power. So with one hand, I could actually represent 32 different states. And that's a five. OK. And you're jumping ahead a little bit. We're going to talk about two hands in a minute, which is what Tom is trying to signal right now. So if I held up one, if I held up, you know, one hand with all five fingers, I might be saying hello. If I held up a hand with one finger, I might be saying bring me a cheeseburger. I'm, I'm on one end of the dining room, and you're on the other end of the dining room, and I'm going to hold up one finger, and that means send me a cheeseburger. I'm going to hold up two fingers. I want a cheeseburger and a Coke, which is what he wants. So we've got all of these different combinations. Now, fortunately, they didn't do anything impolite here with the fingers being held up, so that's a good thing. Um, now, in electronics, um, well, first of all, let me say that uh, for one signaling state, raising your hand, that one symbol or one baud can mean many more than one thing. So for one symbol, I can represent up to 32 different states. And some of you might be wondering, well, where did you get 32 from? And any ideas there? I'll tell you in a minute. Now, so that, that's, that's the, finger, the, the finger talk. Now, in electronic applications, uh, that can be done, the same thing can be done with phase shifts. So if, if we shift the phase of a signal by 90 degrees, or 180 degrees, or 70 degrees, each one of those phase shifts, it's one phase shift, but it can represent a certain number of, of bits. So we can do it with phase shifts. We can change tone frequencies. So if we go from 1,000 hertz to 1,100 hertz, uh, that could represent a certain number, of, a certain state, or a certain number of fingers. 
discrete levels or combination of any of those things. So how in the world with one hand can I signal up to 32 states? That's coming up next. And that the answer is binary counting. And again, they didn't hold up any impolite fingers. Thank you. So let's start over on the right hand side and we're gonna number our fingers one, two, four, eight, and 16. Okay, now if I held up all five fingers, what number would I be sending? There's an answer down here if you don't wanna add 31, or if I held up no fingers, that would be zero or 32. So let's go to this one here. Now in this case, I've got the two finger and the four finger up, so that number is six. So by depending upon the number of fingers I'm holding up, that will translate into a number between zero and, and 31. So for each raise of the hand, that, that can signify up, up to 32 unique states. So you can see how bits per second, uh, if I was doing it uh, one, one time per second with my hand, I, I would have one symbol per second or one baud but I could have 32 bits per second represented by the information that I was uh, conveying to you. That's why bits and, and baud can be very different, bits per second and, and baud. Here's another illustration of basically the same thing. Um, I don't know if any of you are around when, when modems um, became popular and the coolest thing in the world was if you could put a modem on your computer and talk to a digital service someplace. And the, the early modems that came out were 300 baud. And that was just the coolest thing in the world if you could connect to and send email and do all of no, 300 baud is horrendously slow. Any of you today would die if, if you had to uh, operate at that kind of a data speed. So the states are on or off, and we wind up with 300 bits per second, 300 baud. Um, so the baud rate and bits per second are the same there. And then something really magical happened. Uh, what was after the 300 uh, baud modem? Was uh, 600 next? 1200. 1200, okay, well here's 1200. The 1200 baud modem, you're set, we're using the same channel that we were on 300, because that's all the, the phone wires could, could handle. Um, but there, we're going to use eight states, like eight fingers in, in our analogy. That would get us up to 1,200 bits per second on a channel that was formerly only able to handle 300 baud. So that was really, really something. And what came after 1,200? 48. 48, okay. 24 might have been in there, but... Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. But the, the thing was, back, back in those days, um, when the next higher speed came out, it was always at least double, and you just had to have one, right? Because it'd be twice as fast. So that got us all the way up to a theoretical 56 kilobits per second over a, a medium that was formerly uh, only able to handle 300. So the same, same kind of um, thing is happening. Now, of course, the 56K, a lot of people bought those and uh, never got 56K because there was too much noise on the, uh, on the phone line, and it would automatically scale back to whatever it could handle. Uh, they'd talk back and forth and uh, adjust. So very rarely did you ever get your 56K rate for the money that you spent. But that was just the ultimate. If you had a 56K modem, you, you really had it. That was before 3G and 4G and um, kind of things that we, and uh, you know, 100 megabit uh, fiber to your house and stuff like that. Look, looking back at where that came from, that's, it, that, to me, amazing. So now we'll talk a little bit about protocols and codes. Uh, does anybody remember what this might have been? The secret decoder ring, did you ever play with those when you were smaller? Some, some people are nodding. <laughs> okay, in that, yeah, Captain Midnight. The little Orphan Annie ring, which was before my time. Uh, and what, what is this? That's punch tape, yeah, used to send uh, teletype. 
So th those are both related to the discussion. That, that's why I wanted to, to put them up here. So a protocol is rules for encoding, packaging, and exchanging and decoding digital data. And there is a pool question that talks about automatic link establishment slash enable or ALE. And the pool question says, if you've got uh, an automatic link establishment, what kind of control is that? Automatic control. But I wasn't satisfied with that because when I first got into this, I didn't really understand what ALE was. So I thought, well, I, I want to learn what that's about. So I went out on the internet and looked, and it is a real thing. And, um, and I'll, I'll read this, it's kind of small. Now finding more use, uh, talking about ALE, now finding more use in amateur circles, thanks to the efforts of the writers of some multi-mode decoders, such as multi-PSK, when running correctly, it can initiate and establish connections between two stations without human intervention, hence the automatic part. I, got, I blew up this picture a little bit. So the, the ALE protocol, what it does between a receiver and a transmitter, it'll see if it can communicate on 17 meters in this case, and the skip is going right over the top. We haven't had propagation yet, but uh, radio signals can, can miss their intended target because they never come back down to earth again. 20 meters, in this case, was just fine. We can establish a link between this receive point and this transmit point. 40 meters doesn't make it because uh, the skip off the ionosphere doesn't come in high enough. So what ALE does is it's, it tests these paths and it finds one that works. When it finds one that works, it'll say, okay, you can talk on, on this path. So that's the, the basic concept between automatic link establishment. That's pretty cool stuff. Now did I put in the, yeah, I put in a, a web link here that you'll, you'll get in the presentation. So you can go out and learn a lot more about this, but that's the, uh, the basics. But I, I wanted to explain that because there is a pool question and now you know what they're talking about. It will automatically do that. So a code, a protocol is a set of rules for encoding, packaging, and exchanging. Uh, how many start bits, how many stop bits, um, the, what, what are the rules for data transmission. And then a code is a method of conversion to and from digital data, like digital sampling, for example. And there's a couple that are mentioned here. One is called VeriCode, used with PSK31. Morse code also uses a variable length code. And they, both of these do this for bandwidth efficiency. And I'll have a diagram coming up. Bado, five bits requires uh, five bits. Remember, two to the fifth was 32. How many letters do we have in the alphabet? 26, right? Okay. So with, with a code that's only five bits long, all you're going to be able to use it for is, let's say, the uppercase letters and a, and a few symbols. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit more in an upcoming slide. But there's something really interesting to remember, good to remember, of her, but oh, um, five bits. The two go together. ASCII is another form of code. Seven bits normally. There's also an eight-bit version. It'll do numbers and letters without a shift character. So if we've got seven bits, that would be uh, two to the seventh power. I think that's 128. So you, you can get a lot, a lot more. And then we saw that, we saw that. Morse code. Um, I ran across this by accident, and the first extra class that we taught, I, I showed this, and people were just absolutely stunned and amazed. I was too when I saw it the first time. Morse code, first of all, it goes back to 1844, so it's been around for just a little while. And the way this works, um, anybody know Morse code here besides Gary? No? Okay. Well, this, this might be new to some of you then. You're not going to know Morse code when you leave here tonight, but you'll know more about how it was uh, developed. So we're get, there's a point here that says start here. And the concept is they took, uh, and the way this came about was interesting because they were trying to match a code system to the most commonly used letters uh, in the alphabet. And one way that they could do that was uh, back at the time, um, back in the late 1800s, newspapers were being printed with big typecases. These typecases had 
a big bin in the middle that had all E's in it. It had a, a, another big bin for T's. So the, the, the more of a given letter that you needed to print a newspaper, um, that's how big the bins were that you'd put those letters into. They were, they were lead letters. You'd pull them out one at a time <laughs> and, and, and assemble rows of type and then those would be uh, formed onto a page and then inked and pressed onto paper. So those type cases were the basis that they uh, used to determine which letters should have the fewest number of uh, time elements in them. So if we start here, the letter E, which is the most common letter in the English alphabet, is a single dot or dit. So on Morse code, a single dit is an E. So starting in the middle, if we wanted to send a T, that would be a single dash or a da. So the most common letters are closest to this point here. An I would be dit, dit. An S, dit, dit, dit. So you can see how the entire alphabet maps out. And the, what, the letters that aren't used nearly as often are way out on the ends of the tree branches, like Y is da, 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 da. B is a da 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 da. So the ones that have a lot more elements are, are further out the branches of the tree. Isn't that cool? I, I thought it was cool. And a lot of people have never seen this. Say, that is so cool. Now, I would recommend, though, if you want to learn, learn Morse code, do not do it this way. Because if you're counting dots and dashes, you, you're never going to be worth, worth a hoot. You have to learn it by the sounds of the letters. But to see how that came about is interesting. And the connection that we're talking about is, is the very code. The shorter number of elements, um, a shorter number of elements are used for the more common letters. And going back to um, PSK 31, the, uh, the uppercase versus lowercase are, are, are more or less uppercase taking more more bits. So there's an example. Morse code, it's a code that translates English into ones and zeros, and we've kind of touched on this already. The short characters are here, the longer ones are here, and it uh, came about by the dependence on standard English letter uh, frequencies, how often they occur in the language. And then we've got something called the gray code. This goes way back too, and it's got a fascinating history. Um, Back in those days, when we didn't have digital electronics, things ran from relays and switches. And if you had to change a lot of switch settings or a lot of relay contacts, uh, the chances for error were high with, with higher failure rate on those mechanical devices. So the way the gray code works, it's a digital code where consecutive values change by only one bit. And I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Gray code, and it, its benefit is it uh, facilitates error correction because if you go from one number to the next and more than one bit changed, then you know that there's an error. Let me move forward and, and show you what, what I mean by that. So if we go from a decimal zero to a decimal one, in binary, you're going from zero, zero, zero to zero, zero, one, only one bit has changed. In the gray code, it's exactly the same. Only one bit has changed. Now let's see what happens when we go from one to two. If we're counting in binary numbers, we're gonna to have to change this one to a zero. We're gonna to have to change this zero to a one. So we're gonna to have to change two things in order to go from a one to a two, with binary counting. In the gray code, however, they are just adding one bit here from going from one to two, so they've only changed one thing. So that, that's the idea. And I'll, I'll give you one more, the three to four case. When we go from three to four in binary, these two ones have to become zeros. This one has to be a one. So we wind up changing three elements, three switches or three relay contacts. More chance for error. In the gray code, we just add an extra bit here. So we're, the gray code all the way down, the way that it's selected, you're changing only one bit for every number that you increment. And that's the idea of the gray code. It's often used with, it does have a practical application today. Uh, you may have noticed on your uh, more modern radios, 
that some of the knobs have no stop on them. You turn them and turn them and turn them and turn them and they, they never get to the end. Um, if that's the case, you're dealing with what's called a rotary encoder. And here's, here's the pictures of an internal one. This disc can spin as many times as you want. And every time you move it by one position, it's actually incrementing the gray code. And you see that on a code wheel here. I think I got a picture. Yep. There's a code wheel here and a uh, light emitting diode and a detector on the other end that's screened by a, a pattern that's on this rotating wheel. So a, as the real wheel rotates, it's moving in gray code fashion around the, uh, around the numbers. They also have mechanical switches that does the same thing. Say again? There's also mechanical switches that do the same thing. Yes, true. Yep, I'm sure the first rotary encoders were, were more mechanical. Yep. Yep, yep. Today they're digital with LEDs. All right, we're working up to a, uh, a break. Actually, this would probably be a perfect time for a break because we're going to talk about ASCII next. So let's take a break since we've been going a little bit over an hour. And some of you are probably got crossed legs and uh, need, need to run. Mr. Gary. Five minutes. Five minutes, perfect. No, I want a hamburger and a Coke. A hamburger, oh, no, that's, that's two fingers. Yeah, Kirby remembers, two fingers, hamburger and a Coke. All right, we will resume. Well, we ended uh, with the gray code application, rotary encoder. And we were just getting into ASCII, ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And this is really coming into the modern era, 1960. So uh, this revolutionized a lot of things. And the way that it's constructed with seven bits one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's actually eight shown here, if I counted right. Um, and ASCII can be seven or eight bits. It's usually seven. It can also have um, stop bits and start bits um, added to it that make the length a little bit longer. So the concept that we're sharing here is that um, We've got these, these bits all together representing, in this case, the letter A. So this bit combination shows the letter A. And uh, LSB means least significant bit. When we were counting in binary, it was 1 and then 1, 0, um, with the, the, the values increasing as we move to the left, just like we do in, in decimal numbers. We've got 1 and 10 and 100. In binary, it's 1, 2, 4, 8, et cetera. So that, that's how they're arranged here. And this uh, byte, or byte, it, it's called when it's um, um, eight bits long in this case, eight bits. And now we, we can lump them together. We can lump this one with another one. So we can have letter A, B, C, D. So we, we can have a group of letters, which is a bunch of these strung together. And they can further be combined into what are called packets. <clears throat> a packet can have a header in the beginning and parity at the end. So a, a packet can include things like uh, what is the destination for this data. And parity can in include such a thing as um, uh, error correcting information, error detection information, including the, the header for addressing and, and error detection. So that, that's all, all built in. And uh, things really took off when, when these concepts started coming into play. Bado goes back to 1870 from, uh, that was the inventor or the mathematician. It uh, operates off five, of five bits, two to the fifth is 32 characters. And some of you, if you were in our general class, may have seen these before, but these are some paper tapes that you can put that toward the back row if you haven't seen it before. You'll see a paper tape there. It looks something like this. And it's, it's got the alphabet and some characters shown here. So depending upon the whole patterns, we've got uh, punches here and here. 
and these little dots in the middle are sprocket holes. So you could put this tape on a machine and uh, a teletype could actually transmit it. This came from a ham fest actually that I went to. Somebody had all of this equipment set up. They had a paper tape puncher which created these. And then you could take that uh, punch tape and put it onto a teletype machine and transmit a message to wherever another teletype machine was. So that's, that's the basic concept. And because we've only got 32 possible characters, 26 letters, in order to get all of these other symbols, numbers and symbols, there's a shift character that will say, okay, the other end, please now interpret uh, what's to come next as one of the symbols. And then you can shift back to convert it to, to letters. So that's, that's the concept there, five bits. Five bits is going to be kind of important to remember. Now, I don't know if, if this would be practical or not, but some, sometimes we get these Christmas letters from people and it says, Aunt Sally um, got married and, uh, you know, uh, June had a baby and you get all of these nice newsy letters at Christmas time. I suppose you could encode all of that onto a paper tape and then just by sending it to different addresses, put the same letter in each one. It'd be the equivalent of doing Christmas cards today. I don't know if anybody ever did that, but uh, that, that would be an application. A silly one, but uh, it'd be possible. Or you could have a, a news feed that would go out to multiple uh, places in the country. That would be another possibility with the same, same base information included. And here's how the code actually breaks down. Uh, there's a mark tone and a space tone, and here we're dealing more in, in radio terms rather than teletype machines. Uh, anybody know where mark and space came from, those, those terms? Gary's doing sign language with his finger back there, um, but you're supposed to go up so that we have the right baud rate. The, mark and space uh, used to be, uh, be a paper tape and there'd be a pen. And when the, the electrical signal came along for the pen to come down, it was on a spring, so it would be normally up. But if, if the pen were to come down, that it would put a mark on the paper. And when you uh, de-energized it, it would come up and that would be a space. So that was the origin of, of mark and space. But those terms, uh, of course, are still with us today. In uh, TTY, for example, the, the, the two tones, they're normally 170 hertz apart uh, for electronic teletype that we use in ham radio, and we have a mark tone and a space tone. <coughs> and what happens, uh, we're normally at rest, the rest condition, we're sending a continuous mark, and then we have a start symbol, it's one space, and what that one space does is it signals the other end to start decoding. It's sitting there waiting. If it sees a space, okay, start decoding. So here's bit zero, bit one, bit two, three, four. Um, so zero through four, that adds up to five. And we've just completed a character, and then there's a stop symbol, and then another start symbol, and then the next character comes. So that's, that's the way that uh, our TTY or, or RIDI is transmitted over the ham bands today using the Vado code. Now there's some uh, uh, comparison between ASCII and, and Badeau. They both have start bits. They may have, uh, well, with parity bits, um, uh, we, we don't have parity with uh, Badeau. We do have stop bits. So transmissions are asynchronous. That means that the receiving side has no idea when the transmitting side is gonna start transmitting. So it can happen at any time. That's called asynchronous. Transmissions are asynchronous, so, so they need an indicator to signify the start and stop of data frames. That's what start and stop bits are for. Now, a parity bit can detect some kinds of errors. Here's some blue text for you. A single bit. The way that that works, even parity is what is counting the number of, of bits, the number of even bits, um, or number of ones, I should say. So depending upon how many ones come through in, in that ASCII character, um, if it's an even number, then the parity bit will get set to one. If uh, for odd parity, 
an odd number of ones in the data frame will cause the parity bit to be set. So that's the difference between even and odd. In most systems today, uh, in amateur radio, the parity isn't used at all. But the reason that it can detect some kinds of errors is because if it, if it counts the number of bits that are ones and it doesn't match the parity bit, even or odd, that means that there's an error in the data. So it can detect some types of errors. What if there were two errors? That then you wouldn't know. And it doesn't have the ability to correct errors. It just has the ability to detect some kinds of errors. So the, the protocol that's being used could uh, conceivably say, okay, resend it or something like that, depending upon the protocol that, it, that it's um, being used with. So uh, for Bodo, it's 1.5 stop bits. It's uh, one and a half cycles, or one and a half spaces. One for ASCII, and this was interesting to me. They use two stop bits for mechanical teleprinters. Anytime you set up a digital system today with serial communications, they always ask, uh, you know, how many stop bits, one or two? And I always wondered, well, what, what's the difference? Why, why would it care? I had no idea. <laughs> that two bits were used for mechanical teleprinters, which of course are, have gone the way of the dinosaur now, but that, that was the origin. But it, for electronic devices, um, if, if, um, it, it would be a one. Now here's an ASCII table. See, I don't have it blown up any better, but this is a case of a seven-bit ASCII table, 128 characters. So we've got all of the letters, all of the numbers, and certain other symbols, such as ring the bell, which goes back to the uh, old teletype machines, um, line feed, uh, carriage return, thing, things like that. All, all, all those codes can, can be sent in 128 bits, or 28, 128 characters. Okay, ASCII advantage over a Bado can send both upper and lower case text. That'll show up in a pool question. You remember with the uh, Bado, you could only do uh, uppercase. Okay, here's some questions. All right, let's see how we do. What is the definition of symbol rate in digital transmission? Okay, now symbol rate is what's going on over the air, right? The number of times the uh, symbol changes per second. And that would be C, the rate at which the waveform of a transmitted signal changes to convey in information. It might shift phase, it might change amplitude, um, it might go away. Those are all different ways that it can be, can be used. What is the relationship between symbol rate and baud? They're the same. Thank you for not getting tricked. Which of the following HF digital modes uses variable length coding for bandwidth efficiency? There, there was only one that we mentioned. It was PSK31, right? Which type of control, and you better get this one right, which type of control is used by stations using the automatic link enable protocol? C, yes, automatic. It's in the question, it's in the answer. So nobody gets that one wrong. Which is the name of a digital code where each preceding or following character changes by only one bit? D, correct, gray code. And there's some real interesting wrong answers there. XS3 code, what in the world is that? A lot of the wrong answers are real things. <laughs> but uh, some of them are, are just, just crazy. That was one. Okay, E8C10, what is an advantage of gray code in digital communications where symbols are transmitted as multiple bits? Facilitates error correction. You can tell that there, there was a mistake. That's right. And one reason that it might be important to be able to, especially back in the days of switches and relays, uh, if you had a, a nuclear missile controller, you'd sort of want to know if, if the data was correct when it came over. So error correction would be, would be valuable. I don't think we had uh, missiles, nuclear missiles back in the late 1800s though. What are some of the differences between Bado, digital code, and ASCII? 
And there's one particular number that I said was very significant that will make this very easy to answer. Five. Yep. You don't have to read all of those words if you just remember five. Badeau uses five data bits per character. ASCII uses seven or eight. And then more stuff to follow here. But the, the five is, is the key to answering this one. We've got four, five, six, and seven. What is one advantage of using ASCII code for data communications? There's one trick answer in here. See, I heard that, and that's correct. It's possible to transmit both upper and lowercase text. The thing that is a, a, a possible trap here in, includes built-in error correction features. Well, with parity, there's error detection, but no error correction. So just don't, don't get caught on that one thinking, oh, parity, it must be able to correct error. Nope, nope, it can only detect an error. So possible to transmit both upper and lowercase is what we want. What is the advantage of including a parity bit with an ASCII character stream? D, some types of errors can be detected. It's not super reliable, but uh, it's better than nothing. Okay, now we're going to get into some more uh, interesting things about digital characteristics. Okay, modulation common below 30 megahertz. This is the first, uh, first item to be aware of. Modern digital modes have very narrow bandwidths, which, which is one of the big advantages. Now, some of that multiplex stuff wouldn't have that Kirby asked about, but um, we don't use those on HF. So PSK31, bandwidth of 37.5. And it can, it can handle up to about 50 words a minute. That, that was the mode that first came out, and it was a keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard mode, so you could actually talk back and forth amongst hams. And that, that was absolutely the rage. That was the number one digital mode when it first came out and, and for several years. Morse code at 13 words per minute. It's a bandwidth of about 52 hertz, so very narrow. Remember, um, single side, well, it's, it's coming up, single side band voice. Uh, 3,000 hertz, but you can talk up to 120 words per minute. Now, I don't know if anybody's done a study yet, but I, I don't know if this 120 words per minute uh, applies to men or to women, but... but uh, if, Watch <laughs> <laughs> But uh, if any of you want to study that on your own and get back to us, you, you, you could. That would be fine. But you can see the relative bandwidth and the speeds. And there's sort of a correlation here. The higher um, speeds generally tend to take more bandwidth. But uh, speaking at 120 words a minute, that's kind of impressive. And just a random fact to be aware of, because you might see it again, frequency shift keying, FSK, is common data emission below 30 megahertz. Um, RIDI, or RTTY, radio teletype, is, is FSK. Remember that's shifting the, uh, the 170 hertz normally. So a little bit more on frequency shift keying. And we're using uh, radio teletype, electronic radio teletype as, as the example. Two different tones shifting from one frequency to another. Rapidly changing tones are called mark and space. And space represents a zero, mark represents one. And here's a spectrum display. And you can see a very strong signal here with the, the peaks. These peaks are about 170 hertz apart for standard RIDI. And, and here's another uh, waterfall display. A few more notes on, on radio teletype. The standard, uh, which is about all you'll ever see, is 170 degree shift. There were some earlier um, RTTY that were that operated at 200, and of course any any split could work, but software that you would um, get for free or buy today would pretty much always assume the 170 hertz uh, difference between mark and, and space. Now generating FSK, there's a little bit of controversy in um, in the ham radio community about this. And Kessler mentions it a bit. Uh, there's direct FSK and audio frequency shift keying. 
direct FSK, what they're doing is actually shifting the oscillator frequency back and forth, putting a capacitor in series with something in an oscillator to cause that 170 hertz uh, shift in, in tone. So that's direct FSK. There's a data signal that comes from your computer to the back of your radio that's either a one or a zero, and depending upon uh, which it is, it'll, it'll shift between the mark and the space tones. So there's some kind of a computer and controller and goes directly into the radio control lines and this directly modulates the VFO. That's direct FSK. Now audio frequency shift keying, that uses a computer also but a sound card and rather than shifting the oscillator it actually generates tones that are 170 hertz apart and applies those audio tones to a single sideband transmitter and then out on the air. From the point of view of the receiver, uh, if the AFSK is set up correctly, there's no difference whatsoever. It sounds exactly the same. But there is a, a, a slight problem in that if you overdrive the audio with audio frequency shift keying, uh, you can create distortion and, and decoding problems. So in this case, uh, with FSK or direct FSK, it directly modulates the VFO with audio frequency shift keying, single sideband uh, tones are sent. Uh, to send those tones out. So that's the difference between them. And the controversy in amateur radio is that um, some purists think that um, direct FSK is the only way to go. Get better signals um, um, and absolutely won't buy a radio unless it's direct FSK. The fact of the matter is if uh, audio frequency shift keying is set up, there's virtually no difference. So if, if you hear of that controversy, you'll, you'll know what the background is. And you can use whatever you'd like. So there. Now, most software for uh, FSK or AFSK um, will have a tuning indicator. Those are shown down below here. And th this is a happy one. A is a happy one. So diagram A shows proper tuning and equal levels of mark and space, 170 and uh, the, with the 170 difference between the two. Diagram B shows mistuning and one weak tone, because this one's not as long as this one. So it could be possible filter cutoff issues or, or selective fading. Um, selective fading does happen. Diagram C shows mistuning um, or transmitter tone spacing not accurate. So again, they're, they're not a nice uh, perpendicular display. And selective fading may cause one of the ellipses to disappear entirely. And that, that's pretty amazing because these are only 170 hertz apart. And for the fading to affect one and not the other is, is kind, of, kind of interesting. But uh, that can actually happen when the band conditions are, are getting bad. So most software that, that does uh, any kind of FSK, AFSK, um, mode or radio teletype, which has been our example here, will have some kind of a tuning indicator like this to help you tune it in. Now there's a couple of, um, there's an area here that looks a lot more complicated than it needs to be. And it, it's about bandwidth versus symbol rate. And you might have read this in the book and said, how am I going to remember all of these goofy formulas? Because there's, there's two or three different, uh, uh, there's shaping factors and uh, um, some other things that have to be included. So the, uh, and here's a, a formula, bandwidth in hertz equals symbol rate in baud, B, not bits per second, and times the shaping factor. So here's a formula. And the no free lunch comment uh, basically means that um, if, if you're going to increase speed, uh, it, it's going to increase bandwidth. So there's this formula, and then there's a different one for Morse code, and uh, I, I think there's one more as well. But the good news is you don't have to memorize any of those formulas because there's a way that you can estimate the, uh, the values without having to, to, to work the formula. But you, you should know that a formula does exist, and if it matters, if, if you want something more precise, you should use the formula. So here, here's a couple of examples. Uh, bandwidth, K times shift, plus B, 
and some numbers. And this, this is all in our, our book as well. And here's one that's a pool question. Uh, what's the bandwidth of 170 hertz, 300 baud ASCII transmission? And how you solve it, 1.2 times 170 plus 300, and come out to 0.5 kilohertz, 500 hertz. So if you want to apply the formula and memorize it and remember it, uh, more power to you, but I'm going to give you a better way. Here's another one, 400 hertz, 9600 baud bandwidth, and the numbers to figure it out, the right answer. And then th this is the exam tip. Um, you can estimate the bandwidth by taking the answer, uh, or bandwidth with the answer to four times the shift. Here's the 170 hertz shift, 4800 hertz, uh, or words per minute for Morse code. So if, if we were to do that here, um, 170 times four, what, what does that work out to be if somebody wants to do that on their calculator quick? 680, okay, that's reasonably close to 504, and it's the closest answer that you're gonna see in the pool question. This one here, 4,800 times four, what, what does that work out to be? It's okay to use your calculator. Yeah, 19 something, which, which is uh, by far the closest answer to what, what's in the book, or in, in the pool question. So the exam tip bandwidth will be the answer closest to four times the shift, shift or the words per minute if it's Morse code. So CW bandwidth, we'll talk about that. Now the simplest form um, of CW is turning an AM transmitter on and off. Now why do you suppose it have to be an AM transmitter? Why not a single sideband transmitter? Oh, because you need that carrier. Yeah. With a single sideband transmitter, if you turn it on, nothing happens unless you've got audio, right? So an AM transmitter will always be putting out a carrier. So you, you've got to wind up with a carrier that you can turn on and off, which, which is why, that, uh, why it's stated this way. Simplest form, and um, according to the FCC emission designator, if you looked up all of that techie stuff, uh, CW is, is an AM mode for, for that reason. So bandwidth is determined by the speed and keying envelope, I'm talking Morse code. There's a standard word called Paris, which I'll illustrate on the next slide. And the bandwidth of a CW signal is the words per minute times 0.8 times K, where K is three to five, reflecting abruptness of keying waveform. Um, and then there's, there's a, another factor that's in here, re reflecting the, the on versus off time. Um, so you, you can work it that way, and using the formula that way, 13 words per minute, CW, 13 times 0.8 times 0.5 works out to 52 hertz. Um, for this particular one, the words per minute is 13. If you multiply that times four, what do you get? Somebody's thinking it, or working it. 52, it works out to exactly the same thing here. So, so that, that works too. The words per minute or, or the shift times four will get you real close to the right answer. Now we'll talk a little bit more about Paris and it's not the one that you probably wanna go and visit. Um, the CW standard word is Paris. A word in CW is considered to be five characters. And Paris has got kind of a magic characteristic to it. That this is the letter P, da 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 dit. And the unit of measure in CW is, is the dit. So P, da 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 dit, the first uh, dit is considered uh, one space long. And then in between that and the next da is one space of silence. So a, a da or a dash is the equivalent of three dits. So that, that uh, forms forms a P. You can add up all of those little time slots. In between letters, there's three spaces of silence that are one dot long. Here's A, da-da, three spaces of silence, and R is da-da, dit, three spaces, I, S, and then there's an interword space of seven uh, dits, seven, seven units of silence. You add all of that up and you get 50. So there's 50 units of time there. So if I were going to send it 10 words per minute, for example, 
I would be, that, that would be the equivalent of sending the word Paris in CW 10 times in one minute. So that, that, that's why that's kind of a magic word, because it can standardize measurements in, in CW. So 50 dip, and uh, here we're going to show it um, at, calculated a little different way. 50 dit links for the word Paris plus the following space. The dit is the symbol, uh, the fundamental, the shortest symbol, so that 50 symbols per word gives us one word per minute, which is 50 symbols in 60 seconds, which winds up to be uh, 50 divided by 60 or 0.83 symbols per second or 0.83 baud. <laughs> so the, the, all of the math kind of inter, interrelates there, um, just showing how, how that's used. But the, the thing that I find interesting, 10 words per minute would be the equivalent of sending the word Paris 10 times in one minute. Just interesting background. A little bit on PSK, phase shift keying background, or bandwidth. <coughs> phase shift keying, PSK 31, was the most popular mode there ever was when it came out as a digital mode. People used it like crazy. It's still active today, but not nearly as much as uh, some of the other modes. FT8 has pretty much taken over <laughs> the digital modes by a factor of hundreds. It uses a full 128 ASCII um, with variable length characters, the very code. Bandwidth is minimized by shifting phase precisely at zero crossing of the RF carrier. Bandwidth is also reduced by using sinusoidal data pulses. I'll show that in a second. And for PSK31, the bandwidth actually works out to be 37.5. It says that's the narrowest HF signal mode. And that's from the point of view of the test questions that we have. There's actually narrower modes today, but uh, some of those didn't exist when they, they did the question pool. So pretend that PSK31 is the narrowest HF mode for now because that's, that's what the pool question will want. FT8 and JT9 are actually narrower. And there's all kinds of variations of, uh, of PSK. There's 16, 125, and all, all of these others. There's a whole mess, and mess of them. But the one that was most popular was PSK31, and it's still in use. Now, as far as bandwidth being minimized by shifting the phase precisely at the zero crossing points of the RF carrier, um, let me see if I can draw a picture. So here's the zero crossing points, and um, let me draw a signal here. I'm a wonderful artist, by the way. You can see that that's not true by looking at my sine wave. So if, if we're going to shift phase um, at the zero crossing point, that would be right here. Well, let me pick this one. So if, if I'm going to shift the phase, um, I, I, I would want to do it here. And the reason for that is that at the zero crossing point, I'm not putting out any power. If I tried to shift the phase halfway up, I'd have a little glitch here while I was transmitting uh, power, and it, it would cause a wider amount of, of bandwidth or some spurs. So that, that's, that's what's behind this one here. Bandwidth is minimized by shifting phase precisely at the zero crossing of the RF carrier. And then the other one here, bandwidth is also reduced by using sinusoidal data pulses. So if we've got pulses that are, are, are going on, like, like, like here, let me do this one. If, if, if this has got kind of a curved shape to it, um, it it's a lot smoother. There's, there's less bandwidth being taken up than there would be if, if it was a sudden, sudden uh, increase there. That kind of reminds you of a CW keying waveform, but uh, that, that's not what I'm showing in this sense. So bandwidth is minimized by shifting phase precisely at the zero crossing point of the RF carrier. Bandwidth is also reduced by using sinusoidal data pulses. In other words, it's a, more of a smooth bump than a square bump. And now we'll actually get to CW. Fast rise times equals key clicks. Does anybody remember what, what a square wave consists of? How do you make a square wave? All the harmonics. Yeah, all, all of the even or odd harmonics, uh, odd, I guess. 
So um, a square wave is very rich in harmonics. And what, what would happen if you actually transmitted something like this, where you had an extremely steep rise time, uh, you'd be generating some splatter, which would be heard as key clicks on the, received, uh, on the receiver. So what happens here, if we can shape that, if, if we can make the rise time take a little bit longer, we can round out those corners and avoid those harmonics that get generated from, from the extremely steep skirts. Um, and here's something that you have to think about. Increased keying waveform rise and fall times, um, or increased keying waveform rise and fall times to reduce key clicks. Now when you increase keying waveform rise times, that means it takes longer to get to the top. Does that make sense? So if we're going to increase the rise time, it's going to look more like this. If we decrease the rise time, it's going to look more like that. So keep increase and decrease straight, because that's, that's going to matter in a minute. Now, for every product review that uh, the ARRL does in QST magazine, they'll typically give an input. This is actually keying a transmitter. And then they'll show the waveform that's being generated. So the, these, these are nicely formed. Notice that there's a slight delay. There's some latency from when you tell the transmitter to turn on to when it actually does turn on, which is normal. So that's a good one. And now some questions. What type of modulation is common for data emissions below 30 megahertz? There's probably only one that makes sense by elimination, but we'll see if you can either do it that way, B, frequency shift keying. Yes. Correct. What is indicated when one of the ellipses in an FSK crossed ellipse display suddenly disappears? Yep, a selective fading has occurred. Which of these signal modes has the narrowest bandwidth? Right? What is the difference between direct FSK and audio FSK? It is a direct FSK applies the data signal to the transmitter VFO. Uh, it actually applies a data signal to a capacitor that's in parallel with the oscillator and changes the frequency. Yep. When performing phase shift keying, why is it advantageous to shift phase precisely at the zero crossing of the RF carrier? A. A again. It results in the least possible transmitted bandwidth for the particular mode because it's happening at a zero power point. What technique is used to minimize the bandwidth requirements of a PSK31 signal? Yep, I was hearing people wanting to say C, but then not wanting to be first. <laughs> but you reinforced each other, and, and we got it. Yep, and that was this diagram here. What is the necessary bandwidth of a 13-word-per-minute Morse code transmission? You may remember that. Multiply 13 times 4 to get it if, if you didn't. Bandwidth of 170 hertz, 300-baud ASCII transmission. And how, how would we do that? Four times what? It's the shift, right? Yeah, it's, it, it's the item that, that we're shifting. So four times 170. What does that work out to? It's OK to use your calculator. Yeah, it, is, it's, it works out, I think, at 680, which is closest to, uh, to C, 0.5 kilohertz. Okay, necessary bandwidth of the 4,800 hertz frequency shift, 9,600 baud ASCII transmission. That'd be four times what? 4,800. 4, it works out to 19 something, which is the A is the closest answer. So that's what I meant by, you know, the, the shortcut. Well, you don't have to remember all those variations of the formulas. You can get to the exact answer if you use the formula, but um, you don't need to. 
what is the primary effect of extremely short rise and fall times on a CW signal? Yep, exactly. What is, now this one, be very careful. Think, think about this one a little bit because this is real easy to get wrong. What is the most common method of reducing key clicks? A, increase the keying waveform rise time, which makes it take longer to, to rise, smooths it out. And would you believe that's all we have for tonight, and we're out eight minutes early, so you can tell jokes for eight minutes or go home, whichever you prefer. Gary wants to go home. <laughs>